Welcome back to the news today. This is the Daily Debate. Well, a day after failing in their bid for statehood at the UN Security Council, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas signed papers to join the International Criminal Court, setting Palestinians on a diplomatic collision course with Israel and Washington, who may impose sanctions in response. With us in the studio to discuss are Sami Abu Shada, Secretary General of the Balad Party's Tel Aviv Jaffa Municipality, and Amir Orn, Government and Defense Analyst for Haaretz Newspaper. Thank you both for joining us here. But first, we asked our viewers here. Uh, if the Palestinian bid to the International Criminal Court will pressure Israel to change its policies. Ayman Siksek has a look for us here. Ayman, what do you have? Yes, good evening, David, and good evening to our guest in the studio. So as you began to say, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's application to the International Criminal Court could allow him to prosecute the Israeli military for war crimes. But will this move encourage Israel to reevaluate its strategy? We invited our viewers to weigh in. We asked them, will the Palestinian ICC application pressure Israel to change its policies? And let's start with an overview of the global response today to our daily poll. As you can see, David, only 7% replied yes to this question, but the vast majority, 92%, voted no. So a large majority here voting no on this. And also the comments we received today certainly reflected how contentious this issue is. Let's Let's begin with Alan, who wrote to us, this is a double-edged sword. Abbas seeks to change Israeli policies, but Israel must report to the ICC all the crimes that have been committed by Palestinians since the creation of the State of Israel. He adds, then we'll see who commits crimes against humanity. So strong feelings there against the ICC application, and also an interesting point on whether this could backfire on Abbas. But our next comment comes from Nicole, who actually points the finger at the ICC. She says, is the ICC still credible after failing to condemn Syria for thousands of deaths? Israel will not bow down to organizations that are no longer able to manage conflicts of our time. So Nicole is saying the Palestinian application to the ICC may have little meaning eventually. And let's conclude with Yafe, who is looking ahead at what might happen if Abbas fails at the ICC. She writes to us, when initiatives are taken in a hurry and then fail, they become illegitimate and do not come up again. So is Abbas pushing too hard? Might all his efforts result in delegitimizing the Palestinian plight? I'm sure you and your guests will address these points and others in your debate, David, sending it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Simon Siksek, for a look at our viewers' responses here. Well, the the jury's in. It seems pretty clear, at least from our viewers, about what the, what the response on the Israeli side could be from this. Uh, Amir, I'm curious to ask you with a similar question. If it seems unlikely that this move will truly pressure Israel to change policies or, or really change any international behavior, or at least in terms of the Palestinians, what's the point of this move? It's a nice expression you just chose, the jury's in. Well, the jury is out in The Hague. Um, two points. One, the uh, legal uh, front uh, has become uh, much more salient over the last 15 years. Uh, it is no longer a nuisance. It's a real consideration, a real factor when Israel goes to war or when Israel conducts its occupation policy. It must take into account what will happen to it as a nation and to its officials and officers as individuals when they go abroad. The other point is that strategy should drive tactics rather than the other way around. It's not really important whether a particular tactical move is successful or not. What is important is to have a broad strategy. And this is true for Israel as well as for the Palestinian Authority. When Israel pushes Mahmoud Abbas to the wall, uh, with tactical moves which Israel blocks uh, at the UN or if it uh, manages at the ICC, what's the point? Israel should have a partner, a moderate, or at least a relatively moderate partner, and if it uh, uh, is victorious um, at each point, uh, the Palestinians will be even more frustrated and the result will be more violence. So Israel um, would be better off losing once in a while a diplomatic battle. Uh, Sammy, is this, are these moves that we saw this week at the UN Security Council, the International Criminal Court, are these signs of Palestinian frustration? Is that clearly what's being expressed here on the international stage? David, let's first of all bring to the table what is the problem. And the problem here is a very obvious problem. It's the Israeli occupation. 
The Israelis have been occupying the West Bank and Gaza and part of Jerusalem since 1967. The whole world, most of the world, not the whole, the vast majority of the world states think that this is not a legitimate occupation and it should stop. Now, the Palestinians tried different strategies to stop and end this occupation. And there was the, the, the old strategy till the, the Oslo Agreement. But since the Oslo Agreement for two decades, the Palestinians have been trying to convince Israel and the whole world that this occupation should, should stop using peace talks and, and, and diplomacy. It didn't work. After two decades, the Palestinians felt that they are not improving and they're not going anywhere. So now they are trying to try this diplomatical struggle in, in order to achieve something. I, I totally agree with Amir. It is the interest of Israel, same as the interest of the international arena, to make this pressure that Abbas is trying to put on Israel work. And it's it's just a tactic. Do you think we're likely to see an actual case brought against Israeli officials at some point soon? Of course. Of course. I'm, I'm thinking that, that Abbas is taking himself and this, this steps very, very seriously. And when you, the, the, the issue here is that and what, 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 what the whole uh, opposition in the Israeli side against this step is that because of the, all the Israelis know that Israel is condemning, is, is all the time doing war crimes in the West Bank and Gaza, and there is the occupation, and there is the settlements. Because there, and they, of they have something and, and of course, to be afraid of, you see all this Israeli attack against these steps. And otherwise, if Israel was such a good angel, and, and everything is okay, and they are not doing war crimes, they should be very thankful well, for what about Abbas the other side of this coin? What about the Palestinians now being open to the jurisdiction of this court as well? Is there a risk for Palestinian authorities? Yes, of course. Uh, it's a, a double risk. First of all, uh, for the Palestinians to be considered a state, they must have all the attributes of a state, including, or perhaps uh, even mostly, control over their own territory. And uh, if they are not able to control even whatever uh, part of the West Bank that they uh, do have under the Oslo Agreement, and if uh, they say that they are unable to stop perpetrators, perpetrators going uh, living uh, their territory and uh, committing war crimes in Israel, um, there's hardly any point in it. The other thing is, yes, there are uh, people who belong to the Palestinian Authority, to its security services, or to other organizations who are committing war crimes against Israelis, and they are going to be held liable as well. But the point that Sami makes is, is valid regarding the settlements. Israel's main concern has to do with the settlements rather than with war crimes, because war crimes can be um, um, argued against Israel even without the Palestinians there. Any other Arab country which is a party to the ICC, could launch a complaint against Israel. Settlements or transferring civilian population from Israel proper into the territories, this is Israel's most vulnerable point because the U.S. administration has never agreed with Israel's contention that the settlements is legal. And if this goes to the court, Israel is going to be in trouble diplomatically. Well, another major focus of at least the U.N. Security Council bid was about removing Israeli forces from the West Bank by 2017. Uh, what about that? What about just forget the transfer of civilians into this area? But what about the military presence? Is that also a central theme to this. Well, you know, this goes back to 1978-79, the Israeli-Egyptian um, negotiations, out of which came the autonomy talks. And the original idea under President Carter, President Sadat, and Prime Minister Begin was, was to remove the military administration. Uh, this is going to, to happen at the end of the negotiations, hopefully between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, not in the immediate future. Uh, Sammy, now, it, U.S. and Israel now unhappy with this move at the Security Council, unhappy, unhappy with this move at, at the International Criminal Court, could impose financial sanctions on the Palestinian Authority now that uh, many speculate could even lead to the collapse of the Palestinian Authority. I assume that that's a risk that the government understands in Ramallah and they're willing to take. D David, the, the government in Ramallah is understanding the whole process and they were expecting the Israeli and American reactions. First of all, you should really think, why are the Israeli upset? If the Israelis are okay and, and they are doing everything legal and they're, 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 there's nothing wrong in their policies, they should be quite thankful because now, like what Amir has been saying, they can also bring the, the, the Palestinians that they think they are criminals or something to, 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 to the same place. Yeah. 
So I think that the Israelis do understand and the Americans do understand that you cannot defend anymore internationally the Israeli occupation. This is the whole issue here. The Israeli occupation, which is bringing a huge amount of different catastrophes to the Palestinians, not just the settlements, all the war crimes that has been done in all the, uh, all, all, all the wars launched on, on, on Gaza and, and everything that's happening in, in East Jerusalem, Israel, as an occupier, has a lot of, of things that she, they must be concerned of. Now, this international pressure, I think, will do, and it will do bring some change in the Israeli policies. And you can see it now. When, when, when Dr. Omar Barghouti started the whole boycott campaign five years ago, a lot of the politicians and intellectuals were making fun out of this step. Now, you can see every year in the first 100 famous universities all over the world, the apartheid week against the Israeli any occupation and the Israeli policies. So I think that this well, international... First of all, I, I don't see exactly the connection to what we're trying to discuss here about the Palestinian Authority taking risks of the, their own the, existence the, now the, to, the to put international David, pressure on Israel. The, David, the connection is that the, the, the Palestinians now, big part of the leadership of the PLO and different NGOs, are now trying to put as much as they can international pressure to end the Israeli occupation. Now, one, one step alone is never enough. They are trying to do a few steps in different fields to try to put as much as they can pressure. And I think it is strategically an Israeli interest to deal seriously with this pressure and to try to end the occupation as fast as possible. I mean, Otherwise, we'll be going to what Amir was, was, was Well, um, I think it's um, a propaganda victory for the Palestinian cause to define this whole debate as the Israeli occupation. This is only one aspect of the problem. The problem started with the Arab world, including the Palestinians, not recognizing Israel's right to exist or Israel's right to exist within certain borders. And uh, when the negotiations um, become fruitful, the problem of the occupation will be solved along with the other problems of security, of Jerusalem, of refugees, water, and what have you. Now, the next step should await March 17th, the Israeli elections. Results of the elections. Following which, hopefully, there will be a moderate government in Israel able to uh, have uh, or re resume negotiations with the Palestinian Authority uh, for the duration of President Obama's term. If this is not uh, uh, helpful and we have to wait until the next American president is in the White House, uh, January 20th, 12, 17, uh, 2017, uh, we are in trouble because violence will erupt. Americans aside, uh, the results of the elections in March, the Israeli elections, if they do produce a, a government that's willing to sit down at the, top, at the table with Palestinians, do you think we're likely to see the resumption of those bilateral talks? Yes, Are the Palestinians willing? Yes, beca because, you know, there was this illusion of corporations or countries too big to fail. It's the other way around. It's too small to fail. The Palestinian Authority, you asked Sami earlier regarding sanctions. There is no way for Israel or the U.S. to put pressure on the Palestinian Authority because it will collapse. There's no point in it. And Israel wants the Palestinian Authority, Israel even wants Hamas to control Gaza let alone the Palestinian Authority uh, to control the West Bank. You bring up an important point here, Hamas and Gaza, a glaring issue at the table or in the situation for all sides involved here now. Hamas came out and slammed the Security Council move, but hailed the International Criminal Court move by Abbas. Uh, where are they relevant in the situation, Hamas? First of all, strategically, Hamas doesn't have much different views on the historical compromise with Israel. Hamas has probably the same views of talking about two-state solutions, on the borders of the 1967 borders, you bringing say that Hamas out probably has the same views about talking to. It's not, it's not probably. So it's, it's a research that I've done on, on on most of most of Hamas's leaders. Where the, are they hiding the, this information? The first, the first generation. Because their charter speaks very clearly the, about the their intentions. The first generation, David, and the second generation. If you read their journals, a Risala, and if you read their, and you know, most of their serious publications from the leader, I'm talking about since the generation of Ahmad Yassin and Abdelaziz Razizi and all the others, and lately was was the declarations of 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 Khalid. Most of them have been saying that we are ready for a two-state solution. Now, the differences between Hamas and Fatah, David, is Fatah is ready to call it a peace agreement, while Hamas wants to give it a, an, an Islamic 
legitimization by calling it a hudne, not a peace, and not peace. Or extended ceasefire. Yeah, yeah we, 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 but, but but they were ready for for 70 years extended ceasefire. But this is a crucial David. difference because this the Israeli is public 70 is years ceasefire, Amir, is much better than three wars on Gaza in the last in, in, in it, the last I decade. Think it's a, a no, it's true, it's true that in, in practice, within these uh, uh, 70 years, we may have seven wars even if we have a peace agreement. But nevertheless, the Israeli public is no, not going... Not if the Israelis will change their policies. No, I mean, no, but... Not the, if the Israelis will change their policies. But, but um, in the Israeli democracy, the leadership must come back to the public and get its consent. And the Israeli public is not going to support any agreement if it doesn't have closure, if it doesn't have a closing of the books. Now, of course, anything can be later violated. Amir Lauren, Sami Abushad, I wish we had some more time to discuss this. As always, a topic sure to be back on the table with us in the debate. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you for being with us. We'll be back after the break here with One on One.